right. We can just keep singing that song instead. Goodness. So um, last week, we started a new series called Rhythms and Disciplines. And uh, we unpacked 1 Timothy 4, 7, where Paul writes to Timothy and tells him to train yourself for godliness. And we talked about how um, the Holy Spirit, God, God desires to sanctify us by the power of his Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in the believer. And he does so through several different means. But one of the primary means that God uses to sanctify his people are the rhythms we have in our life and the disciplines we choose to practice. We often call these spiritual disciplines in, uh, in the Christendom. And uh, this is what this series is going to be about, how, how God seeks to use various disciplines to shape and mold us and change us from the inside out. And so this is about transformation. And today we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This might be a familiar passage to many of you, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And we are, we are going to read it, and so I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'll read it out loud. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along on the screen. Paul writes to Timothy and says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Let's pray. Father, as we read your word, and this passage is about your word, Father, we just ask that you illuminate who you are through your word today. Help us to see the importance of your word, scripture in our lives. As we seek to unpack this statement in 2 Timothy, but also, Lord, as we seek to know more about how we can practically uh, implement Bible reading in our life, Lord, just ask that you, um, you lead us into a new season, beginning right now, you lead us into a new season of deep and abiding love for your word. I ask that you speak through me this morning. You prepare our hearts to receive your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Well, all right. So uh, today is the, the, the sermon is about the intake of Scripture, Bible intake. And so as you could probably see through reading that passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, um, that is about God's word. And as I stated last week, I'm going to state multiple times in this sermon, the most important spiritual discipline for your life is Bible intake. Um, it is, period. Um, and we'll get into why, uh, why that is. But period, point blank, scripture reading, scripture intake is the most important spiritual discipline that you can practice as a believer and follower of Christ. And we'll get into why. But before we can unpack why, and what we believe about the Bible, we have to know, uh, we have to come to kind of the same place on what we believe and know the Bible to be. So you get, do you guys know what the Bible is? Everyone looked up at that point. <laughs> that was great. Everyone's looking down and I said, you know what the Bible is? And everyone's like, hold on, is he going to tell me something different? Um, <laughs> no, you probably know what the Bible is. Uh, but here's the thing, the Bible is, uh, is the best-selling book in all time. Did you know that? In all history, the Bible is the best-selling book, and nothing even comes close to it in how many Bibles have been sold and given around the world. It's also the most studied book in human history. More scholars, and, and just non-scholars, more people have studied the Bible than any other thing. That, no, that, that's important for us to understand. More people have studied the Bible than any other thing. Period. 
Um, it is the most studied thing ever in human history. Um, more books have been written about the Bible than any other work in human history. Um, more people have died for the Bible, seeking to get the Bible or defending the Bible than any other thing in human history, any other object in human history. The Bible is more important in, in our society than we could ever realize, in our world than ever we could ever realize. And all those things are pretty incredible, and yet, what is the Bible? So is it, is it a book? Yes and no. It kind of is a book. Um, it's not just a book. It's actually a library of books, 66 books to be exact. And so the Bible consists of 66 books that were written by around 40 different human authors over the course of around 1,500 years in three different languages across multiple cultures and across multiple societies. It is a one-of-a-kind document. Nothing at all in all of the world exists like it. Uh, all of the other uh, religions, world religions, sacred writings are nothing like the Bible. It is a completely and utterly unique in what it is. And um, it is incredible. And not only does it consist of 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in multiple societies and, and cultures, but also... It's multiple genres of books within it. It's not all the same. And so there are multiple genres of Bibles in the book. The Bible consists of history books, of narrative books, of law, of poetry, of wisdom, of biographies. That's what the Gospels are, biographies of Jesus' life. Of letters. Um, that's, we often call these epistles in Christendom. Um, those are letters in the New Testament and of prophecy. So there's several different types of books within the Bible. That's why you can read one book and, and you can get confused and you get to the next book and it's totally different. And, and we'll, next week we'll get into uh, the way the Bible was put together and why it was put together the way that it was. And we'll get to some apologetic defending arguments for um, the sacredness of Scripture. But, um, but today I, I just want to talk about what we believe of the Bible. So it is this incredible book, uh, nothing else like it in, in all of history. Like I said, 66 books, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages across multiple uh, societies and cultures, and yet it conveys one beautiful grand story. It's incredible. No man could create this work. The Bible is the telling of God's beautiful work and grand plan of glorifying himself by redeeming fallen man through the person and work of Jesus. Let me state that again. The Bible is the telling of God's beautiful work and grand plan of glorifying himself by redeeming fallen man through the person and work of Christ. All of scripture, all of it is about Jesus. I know that's weird. It's, it's hard to kind of wrap our mind around when we read something in like the book of Numbers and it's just listing off a bunch of numbers and we're like, how does this have anything to do with Jesus? And yet, all of it does. All of Scripture is either pointing forward to Jesus, is looking directly at Jesus' life, or is pointing back to Jesus. All of it is about him. He's the center of all of Scripture. All of it culminates in him. He's the point of it all. If Jesus didn't come, then Scripture would be pointless. All of it points to him. And that's who, that's who Scripture illuminates to us. Um, so Jesus even states this to the Pharisees in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. And Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he says this to them. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have eternal life. Jesus himself even says that scripture testifies to him. All of it points to him. It's all about him. It, it's, it's all, everything in scripture points to Jesus. Every book of the Bible is unique it's been written at a different time in a different context, and yet it all serves the beautiful purpose of revealing God, his grand plan, and ultimately pointing us to Christ. That's what scripture does. 
And so the entire Bible, although it is all of these things, uh, we, and, and it's all over the, uh, it, it seems as though it can never have one grand story. When you just think about, if you got 60, if you got 40 people to write 66 books over the course of 1,500 years, there's no way it would convey one story. And yet it does. Because God's grand plan is woven through how he speaks through human authors. We'll get into a little bit more next week about how God wrote the Bible. Um, But human authors wrote it, but God divinely inspired it. In fact, as Christians, what we believe of the Bible is that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient word of God. That's one of your blanks in your notes if if you're a note taker. The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient word of God. Those are important aspects that we need to gather. And it's taken from uh, this passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So this is what we believe as Christians. The Bible is inspired. This means that the Bible uh, that is given by God uh, through humans, uh, but it is his divine word. He divinely communicates to you through the written word that he gave through them. It's inspired by God. Or as the ESV says, God breathed. It is inerrant, which means it's without error or mistake in its original form. So uh, the Bible is without error or mistake in the original. And then also it is authoritative, meaning that it speaks with the supreme authority of God to every subject matter that it speaks to. It's the God of the universe who's communicating it. So it has authority, supreme authority. You know, all all authority that we think we might have or other people on earth might have, um, it's it's not true authority. (laughs) There's There's only one who has true authority, the authority to create, the authority to take away. That's God. And he communicates Through his word, he's communicated to you. So all of God's word is authoritative. And then the last part, and this is a part that in um, the modern American kind of Western church, this has been an aspect of our belief that has slowly been uh, degraded over time in the, the Western church is the sufficiency of scripture. There's a lot of, people who who claim to be Christians who would say that Scripture is not sufficient. And so, um, as Protestants, we believe that this uh, sufficiency of Scripture, which means that it gives all knowledge necessary for a person to know God and follow Him faithfully. So, we can get all of these ideas, not just from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but this is a great passage that highlights all of those. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, Bible reading, Bible intake, I should say, is the most important spiritual discipline. If if we're going to train ourselves for godliness, if we're going to take on that, Bible reading is the most important spiritual discipline. And, and this is why. Have you ever wanted to hear from God? Just wish he would talk to you? He has. He's talked to you through the written word of God. God's primary means of speaking to his people is through the Bible. God uses scripture to mold you, to shape you, to to reform your thoughts and your your mind, to to change your heart's affections. It's his word that that, um, will, in fact, we're going to read this passage in a little bit. In Isaiah, it says that God's word will, will accomplish what it's set out to do. It will not return void. God's word molds and shapes us and changes us by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's moving in us and changing us and shaping us through God's word. But God's word is used in profound ways to shape and mold the believer. Now the reason why 
this is the most important spiritual discipline is because we could see in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that this, it's by God's word that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. But also, we have to know that while other spiritual disciplines are important, they are all prone to fall into heresy or falsity if they are not grounded in the truth of the word of God. Every other spiritual discipline can fall into heresy or falsity. Your worship can very, just as a perfect example, uh, in a few weeks I'm going to preach on worship. Your worship, uh, you are made by God to be a worshiper. Uh, that's what you are. You, you by nature cannot hold back your worship. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something. And so if your life is not grounded in the truth of the word of God, then your life will worship something other than God. Your discipline of worship, whether you try to, to shape it or corral it or, or whatever you try to do, if it's not grounded in the truth of who God is, which is revealed by his word, then it can fall into things and worship of, of, of things that are not actually truthful, who aren't really God. Does that make sense? And so... Um, all other spiritual disciplines must be grounded in God's word and the truth that he reveals to his people through his word. And so the Bible is, uh, is in a lot of ways our barometer for truth. We use scripture not only to shape and mold us, but we measure everything against the word of God. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see this more as we go through this series, but we measure everything against the word of God, including ourselves, which is why Paul writes to Timothy that it is good, that God's word is good for rebuking us, teaching us, correcting us, and training us so that we're equipped for all that life, uh, all in life that God has called us to. So, okay. I hope I'm setting the groundwork for understanding that Bible intake is, is vital for us as believers and followers of Christ. It's the most important spiritual discipline that you can practice. And here's the thing. The majority of us don't do it. It's just the truth. So Pew Research this past year um, of 2023 reviewed that 55% of church-going Christians... 55% of us don't interact with the Bible at all in any way at least once a week. Not a daily, once a week. And, and this is, if you're, if you're one of those people, and that's 55% of us, I, I, assuming that that is the same for us. If you're one of those people, there's no guilt here. I'm not trying to shame you. Um, goodness, I've been in that place many times in my life. M my hope, though, is for you to see that uh, God wants to speak to you. He wants to, to move in your life. He wants to shape your mind. He wants to change your affections. He wants to do all of this, and he uses his word as the primary means to do so. That his word is largely what shapes you and molds you and changes um, through, by the power of his spirit, changes us to better and more reflect Christ. And so my hope is that you grow to be someone, and I grow to be someone, that is kind of like, do you guys, are you familiar with King David? So he's, he's a guy in the Old Testament. He's the king of Israel. And he wrote a lot of songs. Um, so he was, he was one of those music types. Um, those weirdos, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Kidding. I'm, I'm a musician. But anyways, have, he wrote a lot of songs. And, and one of the songs that he wrote was, is Psalm 119. You know what's really cool about Psalm 119? So it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. It's also the exact middle chapter of the entire Bible, which is pretty cool. And you know what it's about? It's about God's word. It's pretty cool. The longest chapter in the middle chapter of the Bible is about the Bible. And in it, uh, David just goes on and on and on about his love for God's word. In Psalm 119, 103, David says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Do you think of God's word in that way, that it's sweeter to you than honey? Goodness. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to to my path. You might know that one. That's probably the most famous verse in Psalm 119. 
that, that our pathway in life is illuminated by God's word. David later goes on to say that God's word is like a stream in the wasteland. He gets life from God's word. God's word, I encourage you, if, you, if you've never read, it's going to take you a while because it's a long chapter, but if you've never read Psalm 119, go read it. It is, uh, it is amazing to see the guy, the only person in scripture that God calls a man after his own heart is David. Now, here's the thing about David. He didn't live life perfectly. He was actually a murderer. He was an adulterer. He, he messed up in so many ways. But the thing that made David's life unique is that he had a deep and abiding love for God's word. This is part of the reason why God says that David is a man after his own heart. It makes me think of a guy named William McPherson. McPherson was an American miner, and uh, miner as in like mined for, not like M-I-N-E-R, miner. Um, and in 1893, uh, McPherson went, uh, went into a mine and he was doing something, and, and a, a stick of dynamite exploded in his hand. When that happened, um, it actually was in his hands, multiple. When that happened, he lost his hands. Um, it exploded right in front of him, so he lost much of, of his face and, and uh, a lot of his skin on the front part of his body. And um, he somehow survived that, 1893. That wasn't common for people to survive something like that, but he did. And shortly after surviving that and coming out of that, he could, he could hear, but he was blind. He couldn't see. He didn't have hands. And, and he became, he gave his life to Christ. He became a Christian after all of that happening, um, glory to God. And, and after becoming a Christian, he would have people come to his room where he was staying and they would read the Bible to him. And he grew in, in love for God's word so much that he longed to be able to read the Bible on his own because um, he wanted more of it. People could only come for maybe part of the day or, or just for a little while to read parts of it to him and he wanted to know God's word. And so he, being blind, thought, well, maybe I could figure out a way to read the Bible through Braille. And so he tried to learn, but uh, the thing is he, he didn't have hands and he tried to use what, what extremities he did have to read Braille, but they weren't sensitive enough to feel the bumps. And so he thought, oh, I guess this just means that I'm not able to read God's word. But he, he wanted to. And months later, he found out about a, a person um, in England who was actually kind of in a similar situation, not, not through an explosion, but didn't have feeling in their hands and was blind. And this lady who was in that place uh, learned to read through, uh, read by Braille through her lips. It's kind of incredible. And he, McPherson, heard about this and thought, oh my goodness, maybe this is the way that I'm able to read God's word on my own. And so he asked someone to come and teach him how to, to read Braille, and he started to try to learn with his lips, but he learned that because of the explosion, his lips just, he could feel with them, but they weren't quite sensitive enough, and he couldn't read and distraught by this and thinking that there was no other way for him to read God's word, he, he kind of gave up. And uh, a few days later, he was, uh, he was praying. And he realized in his prayer time with God by himself that, funny enough, he, he had wanted to read God's word, but he actually hadn't prayed and asked God to show him how. And so he began praying and asking God, Lord, work a miracle. Do something. I just want to read your word. And thinking that in that prayer that God might miraculously heal his lips and give him enough feeling, he brought the card back up to his mouth and felt it with his mouth and didn't feel anything. And did it again and again, thinking, Lord, please heal me. Please make this work. I just want to read your word. And at one of those attempts, his mouth was open a little bit and his tongue ever so slightly touched one of the bumps and he realized in that moment that his tongue might be sensitive enough to read braille. And so he brought in his assistant to come in and teach him how to read braille and he realized in that that his tongue was actually sensitive enough to read braille and he learned to read braille using his tongue. And over the course of the rest of his life, William McPherson 
devoured God's word and re re read it from cover to cover four times on his own by tongue. Isn't that amazing? Think, goodness, I mean, uh, reading, that, uh, reading that this week and learning about his story convicted me so much. Because here I am, I've got Bibles all over the place. I could read it at any time. This guy's longing, just wants to read God's word. And yet I, so often, I'm your pastor, and I can so often treat it flippantly. And so my hope is that in me and in you, my prayer, is that we grow to have a similar kind of fervor for God's love. So how do we grow in love for God's word? Do you know? The answer to that question? How do we grow in love for God's word? So it's, it's kind of like a circular argument. The way you grow in love for God's word is by consuming it. Because here, here's the thing, God reveals himself through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's the perfect manifestation in God in the flesh and then God reveals the person and work of Jesus and, and, and himself through scripture. And so the more that we read scripture, the more we know God. And the more we know God, the more we, we are enraptured up into his love and who he is and, and care for him. We want more and more. The, the thing about God, the more you have of him, the more you want him. And so the way that we grow in love for God's word is by consuming it. And so I want to get practical for our remaining few minutes here. Um, I want to get practical into reading and, and taking in God's word, the discipline and rhythm of taking in God's word. Next week I'm going to talk some about this same thing. But I want to talk about uh, specifically, so let me say this. There are... Uh, multiple rhythms and disciplines of reading God's word. So you can read it, you can listen to it, you can study it, you can memorize it, you can meditate on God's word, you can journal through God's word. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, but today I want to focus in this last little bit we have here on listening and reading God's word. Now there's a corporate expression of these disciplines and there's a personal expression of these disciplines. Corporate meaning the large gathering. So um, a, a, as a large gathering, we, we gather corporately as a church to, to read and consume and teach and know God's word. So 1 Timothy 4.13, um, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. That when God's people gather, that we're to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. We read God's word aloud for all of us to know. The exhortation, that means to pull out the truths and, and apply them to your life and the teaching. That we, um, we build each other up through God's word. So God's, uh, God's word is the center uh, for all that the church should proclaim. So we gather to worship God, that's the purpose of our gathering, but one of the primary means we do that through is by taking in his word, by teaching his word, by knowing his word, by exhorting with his word. And so uh, this isn't like my time up here, my goal is not to have this be like a TED talk. Um, like I'm not up here to spout off like my, my views on different things in our society or politically or whatever, like that, that doesn't matter. My views on things don't matter. I'm sure you don't really care to hear what I have to say about a lot of that stuff. And so uh, what my goal up here is to read to you God's word, to unpack it and to teach it so that it, it, and take it and apply it to your life. So that you leave here knowing God's word and walking in God's word. That's the purpose of my time up here. And um, it is an act of worship. You're participating participation in this is an act of worship. We sing songs as an act of worship, we give as an act of worship, we pray as an act of worship, and we unpack God's word as an act of worship. That's why all of this is a worship service. We gather together. And so uh, that's, that's the corporate expression of this, but we need to know what's the personal expression of reading God's word. If 55% of us don't really do it that often, I want to encourage you with a rhythm and a discipline of doing this. And so um, first of all, the, the easiest kind of low bar for you to jump into is listening to God's word. So uh, raise your hand if you have a phone, a cell phone, that happens to not be a dumb phone, right? Um, 
So just a normal cell phone, right? A uh, smartphone. Um, so the thing about a smartphone is that you have access to the Bible on your phone through the Bible app. And what's really cool is that the translations on the Bible app have an audio version. If you've never used that, you can use the audio Bible on your phone when you're driving. In fact, that's one of my favorite ways of, of taking in scripture is when I'm in the car, just to, to throw on, on the, the Bible and listen to it as I'm driving. And um, if you're like me, I listen to it pretty quickly. I like to listen to almost everything at like one and a half speed. And John thinks I'm crazy for doing that. But, um, but I, I love listening to the Bible. The other way that you can take in God's word is uh, through, through listening to sermons. So that's what you're doing here. But also you can do that through podcasts and another means. I just want to warn you, be careful. There's bad teachers out there. And so um, just because someone claims to be a pastor or someone claims to have a degree or someone, all this different stuff, that doesn't mean that what they teach is really the word of God, is grounded in truth. And so uh, just want to warn you about that. If you want a list of guys that I, I um, trust and, and podcasts and different things that I, I believe teach the word of God faithfully, then I'd be happy to send that out. Um, but those are ways of listening to God's word. But nothing replaces reading God's word in your life. The discipline of just opening up God's word and reading it is so vital for the Christian because when you slow down and you read God's word, God speaks through the words on the page, but he also, um, he will also direct your time prayerfully. As long as you're reading prayerfully, he will direct your time in reading his word um, and point you towards him more and more as you gain to begin to know him through his word. And so uh, can I give you guys some like just practical, easy stuff uh, of how to read God's word f effectively during your time? Can, can we do, are we cool with that? All right, cool. So some of you guys are like have fallen asleep and, uh, and we need to wake you up. Um, so, okay, so here's the thing. Um, how do we read God's word effectively on our own? Um, everyone's a little different. I'm just going to give you a few tips, and I, I think they'll be helpful. So um, before you read God's word, take a moment to slow down. We have a tendency to read books. If you're a reader, I can sit down and I can read any other book, and I can think of reading it quickly. And, uh, and I have to purposely tell myself, slow down, and then I will, I will pray, I'll take a moment, and I think this is a good practice, just pray and ask God to show himself through his word. And then uh, a really simple strategy of when you're reading through God's word is to use the SOAP method. SOAP method is scripture, observation, application, and prayer. So scripture being that you just read the passage, read it slowly, read it observantly, um, just read whatever passage you have prescribed for that day. Then observation is you just ask the questions like, uh, you just observe it. So are there any commands from God? Uh, what does it say? What does the passage say about God? What does the passage say about man? Uh, does anything stand out to you in the passage? Uh, this is a time to underline and highlight. Does something stand out to you, speak to you deeply? That's a time to underline. You can, just so you know, you can underline and highlight in your Bible. And so uh, God loves that. So feel free to, to underline and highlight things that God is using to speak to you. And then after you read scripture, after you observe it, then you can apply it. Um, that's just asking the simple thing of what might God be showing me in this? Is there any action for me to take? Is there any command for me to follow? Is there any truth that I need to embrace? Is there anything in this that creates angst in me? Is there anything in this that's hard for me to believe? And the goal in this is, in the application, is to conform yourself to God's word, not seek to conform God's word to you. And so asking yourselves those questions is good, and then you end that time with prayer. Thank God for his word and for illuminating his word to you. Um, so that's the SOAP method. Scripture, observation, application, prayer. That's really simple. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the rhythm, this is the last bit here, there's a rhythm that we should establish. In, in order for us to be effective in reading the Bible and God speaking to us through it, um, if you read the Bible today and then you wait three weeks and you read the Bible again one time and then um, all that different stuff, it, it's, it's going to be, uh, you're, you're not going to be um, submerged 
in the truth of God's word. Immersed, maybe, is a better word. You're not going to be immersed in God's word. And so in order for that to happen, we need to establish regular rhythms of taking in God's word. And the best way to do this is to find a Bible reading plan. So um, here we go. Establish a rhythm of Bible reading by using a Bible reading plan. Uh, This is uh, really simple. It's just uh, a plan where it says, like, uh, you know, over the next year or over the next however many days, you're going to read through this book or these books, and this is the plan. You're going to read chapters 1 and 2 today and chapters uh, 3 and 4 tomorrow, and and it just kind of gives you a plan for you to follow. What's amazing is if we don't have a plan, then we're prone to do this. I know we've all done this at some point in our life, the mystical approach. You ever done this? God, I just ask that you say something to me. All right, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow. And you're like, wait, what's going on? That was Psalm 23, 20, uh, 27. And it's like that, that I, I could say God can speak to you that way. Um, but that method of Bible reading, it, it doesn't, doesn't lead you to knowing the full counsel of God's word. And, and it doesn't lead you to read things in context. God, just like a conversation with me or with anyone else, a context matters in that conversation. It's the same thing with reading God's word. And so when you read through a book of the Bible, it gives you context of what's being said. And that's so important. And God can teach you uh, the full counsel of his word if we have a Bible reading plan that takes us all the way through his word. Um, so there's a lot of plans out there. Uh, one of the things I want to encourage you with, if you're not someone who regularly reads the Bible, don't do a Bible reading plan that takes you through the entire Bible in 30 days. There's 1,189 chapters of the Bible. Uh, that, would, that would be a lot, right? So start, start small, like one to two chapters a day. Uh, find a Bible reading plan that has something like that. If you read two chapters a day of the Bible, you read the entire Bible in one year and eight months. If you read four chapters a day, you read the Bible in less than a year, the entire thing. Um, So uh, I encourage you to find one that's not overload, but pretty simple. And then uh, the question also is, where do you start? So if you're not someone who's super familiar with Scripture, if you don't know the Bible very well, um, maybe you haven't really read the Bible much in your past, then I encourage you to start in the New Testament with the life of Christ in the Gospels. Um, Jesus is the one to whom all scripture points, and so start with the, the, the biography of his life in the Gospels. Um, when? When should you read God's word? Everyone's different, uh, but uh, establishing a rhythm of regular Bible reading uh, helps by setting a regular time for you to do it. If you do it whenever you get around to it, then you often don't get around to it, right? And so establishing a rhythm of a regular time, a- around 15 to 20 minutes is all you need to read a couple chapters and to do the soap method. And so you don't need a ton of time, um, but God will use those 15 to 20 minutes mightily. Um, but I would say for most people, mornings, before you kind of get your day started, like after you wake up, works really well, um, or evenings before you go to bed. I'm not a morning person. My wife can attest to that. When I wake up, it takes me like 45 minutes to become fully human. Um, I was like another person, okay? I'm like half gargoyle or something. I don't know what I am, but and it takes me a while. And so, uh, so right as soon as I wake up in the morning, it's just not, it just, it's, it's hard for me. I, it just, it doesn't work that way. And so for some people reading at night before you go to bed, uh, I went through a season of life where I read during my lunch break. Uh, that was a great time. I was able to peel away from work and, and go eat lunch. I, my, my office was right by a park, and I would walk out into this park every day. And I would eat my lunch and read God's word. Um, so you could find a time that, that works for you, and consistency is key. When you begin to regularly open God's word and seek to hear him through it, um, then he, you will realize that he begins to speak to you through it. And he will slowly begin to change your life, transform you from the inside out as you know him through his word. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. I mentioned this earlier. And um, I I just want to read it to you because this is God giving a promise. 
about his word. He says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's promise in this to his people is that his word will accomplish his good purpose in you. He promises it. So seek him through his word. I want to conclude by just letting you know um, this week, on tomorrow, we're going to send out to you a Bible reading plan that I created. Um, and so if you don't have a Bible reading plan, then ta-da, I've got one for you. Um, yeah, so, hey, and this is, this is just a start. So um, the Bible reading plan is two chapters a day, and it starts in the book of Luke, takes you into the book of Acts, then goes into the book of Romans, and then into Galatians and Ephesians. It's 40 days, two chapters a day. Each day I give you uh, just a really simple prayer prompt that you can pray after reading the passage. But by reading two chapters a day over the next 40 days, then you, you read through Jesus' life, the start of the church and what God did early in the church's existence, and then you read further on about the the depth of theology that was uh, articulated through the Apostle Paul in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And so um, I, if you don't have a Bible reading plan, we're going to give you one tomorrow. And um, we can spend the next 40 days un unpacking God's Word, and that way I'm going to go through it with you. And this is just a start. It's 40 days. It's not for the rest of your life. Um, but from there, maybe we'll, we'll come up with something. Um, next week, next week we're going to unpack um, some more disciplines uh, tied to Bible intake. This week, I just brought up how you could read the Bible. This was kind of like the broad, um, but there's a way to, to know God's word with depth. He wants you to know his word broadly, but he wants you to know it with depth as well. And so we're gonna unpack how we can go about doing that. And then also, one of the things that I wanna address, I'm gonna try my best to do so next week, so there's a lot of misconceptions about what the Bible, uh, how it was assembled, what it really is. Um, there's a lot of, if you just go online for a moment, you see a lot of things that are not based in scholarship, that are not based in truth uh, about the Bible. And so my goal next week is to just tackle a few kind of main objections that people have to believing that, that the Bible is God's inspired, inerrant, uh, authoritative, and sufficient word. And so uh, that is my goal next week. Please, if, if, uh, if you have a friend who's skeptical about the Bible, bring them. And I probably won't convince them, but my prayer is that the Holy Spirit moves. And, uh, and that they, they walk away with, uh, with knowing God's word and believing it is truth. Um, can we, this week, create room for God to speak to us through his word? Can you do that? Hey, I, there's, no, there's no guilt in this. There's no, like, uh, I'm not trying to shame you. Like, some, uh, I don't want you to walk away thinking, like, oh, my gosh, this guy's hammering the Bible into me. It, it, I can remember I grew up as a pastor's kid. And so, like, um, someone talking about quiet time, that was the word we used growing up. Uh, man, that, that would shin, send shivers down my spine. I didn't want to have anything to do with that when I was a teenager. I pushed back on it so much. But as I grew uh, to know God more, I realized that it's, it's his word. His, his word uh, works in us so much more profoundly than we could ever know and realize. And so let him work in you this week. Uh, on your way home, I want you to do this. On your way home, if you're married, talk to your spouse about a time a rhythm that you can establish of regular uh, Bible reading. If you've got young kids, like Karen and I do, then that might mean that you're gonna have to tag team a little bit, that you take the kids at this time, I take the kids at that time. You might have to figure out ways that you can help each other 
um, read God's word. Um, if, you're, if you're not in that boat, then maybe you need an accountability partner that can help follow up with you and say, hey, have you been in God's word this week? Um, all of this is really good and really healthy. Um, so let's talk about that as we leave this morning. Let me pray for us, and then uh, the band will come up and lead us in one last song. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives and in our church. Um, Thank you for um, how you speak through your word. Your word is life. Your word is truth. Father, cultivate in us a a love for your word that is deep and abiding. May, May we leave here and run and cling to your word. Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you, you stoke in us a real and deep love for you and your word. Help us to make room for you this week um, as, we, as we go about our normal daily routines. Help us to see where we can make room for you to speak to us through your word. Be with us as we continue to worship you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.